This week's episode of The Obsessive Viewer is sponsored by Westworld FM, the latest podcast from the Midwest Podcast Network. Westworld FM seeks to dissect the latest episode of HBO's Westworld TV series every week. Join Alex and Nick as they take a deep dive into the latest TV show from producers Jonathan Nolan and J.J. Abrams. New episodes of the podcast are available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more the day after the TV show airs. Check out the show at westworld.fm or search for Westworld FM on your favorite podcasting service. And thank you to Westworld FM and the Midwest Podcast Network for sponsoring this week's episode. This is Matt Hurt at Obsessive Viewer on Twitter. This is Tiny at Obsessive Tiny on Twitter. And this is ObsessiveViewer.com's The Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Obsessive Viewer. We're a weekly movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be it genre, trope, movie, or show each episode. You can find back episodes at ovpodcast.com, find the blog at obsessiveviewer.com, and you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash theobsessiveviewer, where you can find a link to join our Facebook group and join our conversations post and pre-episodes. Um, and for the last time, because this is the week of... Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Tickets are on sale for Shocktober in Irvington 3. Um, you can find more information at shocktoberinirvington.com. It's a one-night event screening of short horror films from local filmmakers here in Indianapolis. We have a great lineup this year, and it's going to be a blast. We, I'm really excited about the pre-sale tickets that have also been sold and everything. So uh, you can go and buy your tickets at shocktoberinirvington.com. If you buy online, you can get $1 off the price of admission when you use the promo code PODCAST1 when you buy your tickets. And, uh, yeah, and we're really excited to see everyone. Yep. Yep. And, uh, finally, if you plan on attending Heartland Film Festival later, later this month, you can support the Obsessive Viewer by using the promo code OBSESS16, that's O-B-S-E-S-S-16, when you buy your Heartland Film Festival, fe- Film Festival <laughs> tickets online at heartlandfilm.org. For every ticket sold with that promo code, Heartland will give us $2, plus you'll save $3 buying tickets online. And uh, one of the movies I highly recommend checking out is The Invisible Patients, a really great documentary I saw at Indie Film Fest. Um, so yeah, so having said all that, Tiny, how you doing? I am magnificent. Great. Are you seven? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I'm actually 29. Oh, good, good. Thank you very much. Over the weekend, though, we celebrated my grandmother's 90th birthday. I saw that. 90 years young. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it was fun. Her her well of stories like that she's accumulated over those 9 years was probably a pretty uh pretty probably a pretty deep water horizon in it <laughs> or something. <laughs> Stop trivializing <clears throat> the life of my grandmother. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I I don't mean to sully her name. I don't... <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, i'm surprised you held it together through all that i know you didn't even you didn't fumble that or anything i know uh, uh, so that's good to hear though that's that's awesome uh, uh, you suck <laughs> i'm just kidding of course uh as i know she's a, a faithful listener uh happy birthday <laughs> <clears throat> yeah um, so, uh, so this week on the podcast, we're doing extended potpourri just because, uh, it's the week leading up to Shocktober and Irvington, and we haven't really had that much time to watch anything for the podcast and make notes for some, like, what's usually a pretty half assed critical <laughs> analysis of whatever we're talking about. <laughs> uh, so extended potpourri for first time listeners is just, uh, uh, potpourri is a section of the podcast where we talk about whatever we want, and, uh, this episode is just gonna be ex- an extension of that. Um, but first, I have, like, uh, a, a, a little bit of news to go over, Tiny. And there's a few things that I know that you're not aware of, or a couple things that I think, I don't think you're aware of. You don't of. know. I don't know. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, so. Pro- probably not. Yeah. So, uh, I'm just gonna run through these real quick, cause we actually have a lot for Poopery today. So, Tiny, are you aware of 20, uh, 24 Legacy that's coming out? Uh, I briefly saw a headline. Yeah. It's got uh, one of the guys from Straight Outta Compton playing the lead. It's not going to have Jack Bauer. It's going to be kind of its own, it's, it's sort of a reboot in the same universe kind of thing. Um, Is it the guy who played Dre? I think so. I kind of forgot about who they casted. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> You're just like I, on a roll. I know. <laughs> wow. So anyway, um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what 
the deal is with it. I haven't really paid that close attention. I saw one trailer for it and I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, I've kind of really wanted to go back and I've, I've at least thought about like giving the last like few seasons of 24 another shot. Me too. Um, yeah. And just because I, I kind of want to watch live another day, which is available on Amazon. They're all available on Amazon prime. Um, just so that I can watch this new show while, you know, being, you know, current with the, with the franchise. But anyway, so 24 legacy, it turns out that they're bringing back, uh, Carlos Bernard as Tony Almeida. Awesome. <clears throat> right. Which if you, if you watched 24, like Tony Almeida was like, he was, he was such a great, um, character to kind of counterbalance, um, uh, Jack Bauer throughout the, throughout the series. And it was just, I, I'm excited to, that he'll be back because, um, he's, he's, he's a really great character, even though they did some questionable things with him later in the series. Right. And, uh, so that's exciting. We'll see how that goes. Um, 24 Legacy could breathe in new life to, uh, the franchise. Um, maybe. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Um, so then the next piece of news I have is that, uh, Marvel's The Defenders announced, uh, who's going to play their villain. Did you hear about this? I sure did. Nice. Do you want to break the news to the two people who don't know about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sigourney Weaver. Right. Who, I mean, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. She's, you know, a storied actress, if you will. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite movies of all time, Alien. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Let's just talk about Alien. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's mean. Um, no, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I'm always excited when, shows on netflix get like huge actors Mm -hmm. like when kevin spacey was gonna be on house cards i was like why is kevin spacey on netflix (laughs) you know and now they got like sigourney weaver like that's that's awesome it's just i love that major actors are committing to what a lot of people still consider a niche forum or medium if you will absolutely and i'm kind of i'm it's funny because you think of like the the defenders as being like Netflix is the Avengers essentially right like the Netflix version of the Avengers you have all of these you know super powered people or these or these you know hero figures that that all have their own standalone thing coming together for a team up thing and you think that the you think that the main villain would be like okay we have no idea who Sigourney Weaver is playing right or or what her character's like but it's funny because all the villains in the show have are all in the series leading up to it to an extent have been kind of grounded. I mean, David Tennant was freaking incredible and like oh, Kilgrave's powers like that's that was such an incredible representation of those powers. I know. Just amazing. Chilling. But, oh yeah. So it's it has me curious what kind of what she's going to bring to the table because to contrast that against what they've been doing with the Avengers for like a million years at this point, um, uh, or like 10 years, whatever. <laughs> um, <clears throat> more like eight, but anyway, um, <laughs> is they've been building up Thanos. Right. And they've been building up Thanos as like the big bad of the universe. He's indestructible. He's like, he, he's massive. He's going to be, you know, a force to be reckoned with. And then you have to count to, um, uh, as a counter to that, you have Netflix being like, okay, well, here's Sigourney Weaver, this very well respected, um, genre actress, um, from, from very iconic properties and everything. And then, like, that alone is like tantalizing, but I'm just, I'm curious how they're going to make her a, uh, worthy adversary for the Defenders. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. we'll see. Yep. And, uh, to kind of round out news, two really brief ones, uh, the Power Rangers trailer came out. Um, Tiny, did you watch this trailer? I sure did. Yeah, what did you think, and what is your history with the Power Rangers? Uh, you know, like most most young lads of our generation, I watched the show pretty regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted the toys really badly. I never got a Megazord, oh, which hurts to this day. I think we've talked about this, but yeah, yeah, I totally had one or whatever. Thank you. That, that you're helps. welcome. That you're helps. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I, I I liked it a lot as a kid, um, but you know. That was a long time ago. Um, in the, the short that they came out with mm-hmm. a couple years ago with uh, James Vanderbeek. Yeah. Unconnected John, to this movie. Right. And John yeah. Moxon. Right. Um, Jesus. Yeah. And Katie Sackhoff. That, that was like super cool and like mm-hmm. really gritty and dark and everybody liked that. And it kind of 
regenerated a lot of people's enthusiasm for the franchise. Mm. Um, so hopefully they can capitalize on that. Right. I don't think that's the tone they're going for though at all. I know, yeah. I know, but I think, but again, just the presence of that mm-hmm. kind of help. I think it's going to, might do them some favors when the movie comes out. Sure. And, uh, so I watched the trailer too, and I was a massive fan of, of the show growing up. Um, really, uh, really the first incarnation of, of the series was what I was a big fan of, but once they started changing everything, I was just like, I, I don't have the attention span for this. <laughs> so, um, like I, I, my mom took me to the first night screening of, of the original movie. Um, or like the day it came out, like after school or something. And, uh, it was just, it was, it was an event. It was a big part of my childhood. Mm-hmm. And so seeing this trailer, a couple things stuck out, stuck out to me, stuck out. I, I've said that before in the podcast, but anyway, <laughs> stuck out to me. Uh, one is that, okay, the tone is, it's, it looks like it'll be, Silly, but not campy that much. It looks like it'll be like I talked to, I talked to Mike in, in our pod chat. Mike, the co-host is on sabbatical. He, and he said that it's, it's clearly like it looks fun, but it's clearly not made for us. And I'm like, I agree. Um, it does look fun, but it does have like some of that like teen, teen demographic style of acting and, and, and putting stuff together, uh, plotting and stuff. Which is fine, but I think I'll be put off by that, but whatever, it's not made for me. But the thing that, the thing that really, the thing that really stuck out to me in a negative way was the trailer, the trailer, and I don't want to go on a rant, but the trailer set everything up as these characters, these teenagers, um, become the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers because they stumble upon this weird, place and it gives them it gives them superpowers and i'm like that that bothers me pretty deeply because the spirit of that original series that original series is like like there are so many kids that grew up or are now adults but that grew up like loving the idea of like martial arts and like and like uh learning karate and stuff because that was such a specific part from my memory at least of the original mighty Morphin power rangers is that they were they were all kind of you know martial artists um that don't work yeah um martial artists yeah. martial artists and uh, i put a weird emphasis on, on the words but anyway <laughs> they were all really into martial arts and that was kind of like their thing and so they were kind of they were recruited by um, whatever. So anyway, so that was the big thing, but to have them, it just kind of seems like a sign of the times like, okay, well, Hey kids, you know, don't work at something to make it great or to be great at it or anything. Just, you know, stumble upon a construction site or whatever, and you'll have powers. You are such an old man. right I now. I am. I am. You're like, get off my lawn right now. I really am. <laughs> and it's, and it's, I don't like it. I don't like, I don't like 30 year old Matt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that kind of bothered me. Does it, does it, make any sense at all yeah it's a little lazy on the mm. the part of the writers you know i mean they had they had to have very skilled actors and stunt people who could actually perform martial arts when they did the original show right and you know with this latest iteration they just have to they can write it out mm-hmm. write it out of the script by just you know you get your powers through magic you know and Maybe it'll be cool, you know. I think it would have been cooler if they had gotten like the dudes who did the raid redemption and just had like <laughs> the most badass martial artists, like that would be pretty super intense. talented choreographed fights mm-hmm. that were like very, <clears throat> really good. That have been that would have been cooler, but yeah. well, we haven't seen the movie yet. Maybe it'll work out. Right? Yeah. But I'm, that I'm first, a, I'm a little hesitant though. Sure, I'm, I'm with you there. Sure. That first trailer looks like to echo what Mike said in our pod chat. It looks fun, but just not for us. Right. But yeah. Uh, so finally, the final piece of news. New final piece of news. <laughs> the final piece of news. Uh, before we get on to our extended potpourri. And by the way, guys, I am recovering from a cold, so if my voice sounds weird or if you hear weird noises, that's me. Um, a likely story. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why either. But anyway. Um. <laughs> so. Uh, they announced, or, or, um, I don't remember who it is. I don't have the article up, but one of the guys from, I think, Sony, uh, said that the Dark Tower trailer will be coming out around Christmas. Uh, yeah, I saw that. You showed me that. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Apparently, apparently there's like a leaked trailer that's kind of making the rounds around the internet. Um, I haven't tried too hard to find it. I don't, I don't, 
I don't think I want to see it until they officially release it. So yeah, I don't know, but we'll we'll uh, we'll follow the story as it develops throughout right. the course of the podcast. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's kind of our news for the week, and uh, yeah. So as we said, this is going to be an extended potpourri where we we're just going to kind of go back and forth and talk about stuff we've watched recently. Why don't you get us kicked off with the, your first one, Tiny? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I first wanted to bring up uh, the latest HBO series, uh, Westworld, mm-hmm. um, which the there's a whole other podcast about it <laughs> uh, that is sponsoring us. Westworld.fm. Yes. Um, but, you know, I, I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. The, the trailer for this came out like month, like six months ago. Yeah. Like a long time ago. It was like delayed at one point. Oh, was it? Okay. I think so. I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Well... I'm not surprised it was delayed because, uh, because I was really impressed with the like production value. Really, of this nice. of this first episode. Um, for those who don't know, it's it's a latest show from J.J. Abrams and uh, Jonathan Nolan, um, also produced by Michael Crichton, mm-hmm. uh, based on one of his novels. Um, Who's he? He's dead. I know, but he's still a producer on it. Gotcha. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew he was. Yeah. I, I didn't know if you knew. That I did. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's producing from the grave, <laughs> from beyond. Sure. Um, but uh, the show is about essentially a. It's almost like a real life video game, like a, mm-hmm. a real life massive online role playing game. Sure. MMORPG. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like that, and it's in the future, and you can just basically enter this world where they have robots and stuff that are it's like the old west not doing it justice um (laughs) but it's it's a really intriguing story and just obviously they literally created an entire dream world where like literally anything can happen and Mm -hmm. it's uh i mean just that right there is really encouraging because there's so much potential there to just Mm -hmm. do whatever they want you know turn this into a, a a 10 season uh, series and it'll be it'll be compelling every year um, so that's what has me intrigued about it all the people involved um, a really impressive cast been a fan of Evan Rachel Wood for a long time she's a great actress um, and then they again you know getting some big stars uh, on television like Tandy Newton who has I guess she hasn't done a lot lately but wow. still a pretty pretty big name yeah uh, Jeffrey Wright James Marsden. Man, I love Jeffrey Wright so much. He's yeah, he's really great. I like that they're keeping you know HBO in the family because he was in Boardwalk. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Ed Harris, huge name, and probably yeah. the biggest get, at least in my book, Anthony Hopkins. Nice. They have like a traditional British actor, Oscar nominated, Oscar winning actor. I mean, it's Anthony Hopkins. They got him on right. an HBO show. I'm just, that like blew me away when I saw him. I was like, Anthony Hopkins is doing a TV show? <laughs> I mean, and I think it's fantastic. It's great because I, again, I'm super impressed by actors who commit to a television show like that. Yeah. Um, so all those things combined had me super intrigued, uh, for the show. And I think the first time I saw the trailer, I was like, yeah, I'm going to watch that. <laughs> um, and I was very pleased by the, by the opening episode um they didn't it didn't feel like a pilot or anything mm-hmm. it didn't feel like they were you know they had a limited budget and they couldn't show you everything they needed to um it was very inclusive and detailed and they paid attention to everything and there, i mean there's like gosh there's got to be like 50 speaking parts in the first episode i mean nice. there's just so many people involved um and it's such a massive production uh, i'm really impressed with how how it all went off without a hitch, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It's like you're, it's kind of like you're, you're along for the ride and you're kind of like appreciating the, the production value of the actual West world within the show and also appreciating the show. It's kind of like two things. It's, uh, it's very, it's, it's kind of surrealistic that way. Mm-hmm. I was very impressed by it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you know, divulge too much or go into too much detail, but, uh, I'm super excited for the season and I think they had a great premiere and I hope it's doing very well. I mean, it has a 9.2 out of 10 on uh, <laughs> IMDb, which is encouraging. So, I mean, probably check back, uh, in however many weeks 
And I don't know if we'll do a whole episode on it or anything, but uh, I definitely want to report back and see how the first season went. I would say, yeah, we will. Awesome. Hopefully. We'll see. Um, on that note, a uh, couple things. One, well, I guess these kind of dovetail into each, o- each other, but this kind of eases into my first one. Um, you said that it was based on Michael Crichton's novel. Yeah. Um, that's incorrect. It's oh, shit. actually... <laughs> <laughs> it's actually based on uh, his screenplay. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Which he directed um, the movie Westworld in 1973. Oh, wow. Yep. Which is my first book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I watched Westworld, the original, um, uh, the 1973 movie, um, because I'm weird and I want to watch things in sequence and I don't know why. Yeah. Um, and I haven't even gotten a, gotten a chance to watch the premiere episode. But I did watch the original movie, and uh, the movie is, the pieces are there. And it, it made me really excited for what J.J. Abrams and Jonathan Nolan, all the people involved in the HBO show, are going to do. Um, because the the pieces are there for there to be something really incredible. And the fact that there it's a, it's on TV, on HBO, like king of long-form television shows, mm-hmm. um that's that's great for this subject matter is a great idea for for long form storytelling on television uh the movie didn't quite do that much for me okay um it's it's pretty good um i think part of it was um the fact that it's it was the uh it was what was par- uh, the original movie was the basis for one of my favorite Simpsons episodes, um, Itchy and Scratchy Land. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they uh, where they go to Itchy and Scratchy Land, and and the robots kind of wreak havoc and and uh, go after them. Um, so like that's one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. In this, it's parodying this movie, and <clears throat> and uh, so so throughout the whole th- throughout the whole like first act, I'm sitting there in my head just replaying the the line. In uh, in the Simpsons, where they're um, being taken to Itchy and Scratchy Land, and the pilot or whoever is like, uh, "Welcome to Itchy and Scratchy Land, where nothing can possibly go wrong, <laughs> possibly go wrong." Well, I guess that's the first thing that's gone wrong. <laughs> and, uh, just the, something about it is just it makes me laugh every time I think about it. So I was thinking about that throughout it. So I didn't watch this movie with the clear focus of someone who was. Um, you know, I don't feel like maybe I gave it that fair of a chance. Having said that, the stuff in it is is pretty good. Um, there's a lot of stuff in it that I enjoyed. I just feel like it, there wasn't enough meat there for me to really sink my teeth into. Um, Yul Brynner plays um, a, a robot in the movie, <laughs> um, who's just referred to as the gunslinger. So nice. I liked that. Um, he's really good. Um, like he's he's really good at playing that kind of robotic kind of villain character. His, his performance was actually, um, I believe it's what inspired, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, like Arnold Schwarzenegger crafted his, his portrayal of the Terminator after Yul Brynner's performance in Westworld. That's cool. Yeah. So it was really cool. And there's some, there's some really good stuff. Um, and I like the, I like kind of the, basically all the stuff that I hope that they'll flesh out in, in the show. Um, but I just feel like there wasn't enough there. Um, by the end of it, I was just like, okay, all right, all right cool. This is this is cool. I'm ready for it to be done. <laughs> so overall, I thought Westworld, the movie, was pretty good. And um, it has me excited to get around to watching Westworld, the show, uh, when I have more time. Cool. Yep. Okay. And uh, I have I have another thing. I, I have multiple things. I'm going to go ahead and go to my next one. Okay. Um, and then we'll get back to Tiny. So... Uh, recently I've watched a lot of movies in the theater and, uh, one of which is the movie Sully, uh, the new Clint Eastwood movie starring Tom Hanks about, uh, Sully Sullenberger who uh, landed the plane in the Hudson, right. um, saving a lot of people. So first of all, I want to preface this by telling a little story about kids in the movie theater. Oh boy. So, okay. So here's my, here's what happened when I went to go see Sully. It was after work. It was a particularly tough day at work. I was just like, you know, like on those days, I'm like, okay, I have X amount of time to go from work to the theater. I can watch a movie, decompress, feel good about things, go home, hang out with my cat, eat dinner and go to bed. Like it's kind of a, kind of a ritual that I like to do is I like to, you know, 
go see a movie to kind of wind down. So I go to the theater and I'm in line to get tickets. I'm kind of on the fence. It's like, okay, well, it's, it's starting here in like three minutes and I'm not going to get a good seat. And I'm just in there like, okay, fine. Uh, I'll, I'll stick it out. I'll stick it out. So at the front of the line is a group of about eight to 12 kids that are no older than 13. Like, like the highest age of the, of the group seemed to be about 13 years old. Okay. And so I'm like, where are their parents? And then I'm like, their parents aren't here. Okay. And so this is a Friday night. And then I'm like, I wonder what they're here to see. And I'm like, obviously they're not here to see Sully. Right. Um, then I hear one of the kids say, one for Sully, please. And I'm oh. like, what? What? So I'm like sitting there and like, I'm, I'm not going to, ju- I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I walked out of the line and walked back to my car. I was like, <laughs> nope, nope, noping the hell out of there. And then, I don't blame you. Yeah. So as I got to my car, I was like, okay, this is dumb. It's seven o'clock on a Friday night. All of these kids are not going to go see Sully. The, <laughs> the biopic about like the, the docudrama biopic about, um, the pilot landing a plane in the Hudson that's by, freaking clint eastwood like they're not these kids are not seeing this movie and i'm like obviously the movie's pg-13 they're just wanting to see blair witch or something Mm -hmm. so i'm like okay cool so i walk back in (laughs) i get my ticket and i go to the concession stand to get a small drink and uh and then i kind of look over and i feel more at ease because blair witch is playing right next to sully Mm -hmm. and i see a couple of the kids come out of the theater and so i'm like okay good they're about to go back into that they go right to the concession stand. So I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> so I go into the theater and it's like packed. It's, there's a lot of people. Yeah. So I sit kind of near the front, about the fifth row back. And then all of them come in and they occupy the first three rows. Oh, crap. And I did a head count. There was 12 of those little guys. Ugh. Um, I had to censor myself there. <laughs> um, and so I'm sitting there thinking like, okay, all right. Um, they're going to wait for the previews to start so they can sneak over <laughs> to see Blair Witch. Like normal freaking preteens. Yeah. They're not going to ruin this movie. They're not here to see this movie. They're just not. <laughs> so eventually I like, you know, I let go of that dream of them not being in the theater. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was the weirdest thing because we're sitting there, like the entire theater collectively is sitting there. They're doing their kid thing. They are like making noise. They're talking. This is before the preview start. They're jumping around. They're switching seats because no kid can sit still for five minutes. Um, wow. And then it got to the point where it's like, it's like the theater knew the theater, the theater was the theater and I were in the same headspace. <laughs> A security guard came in nice. and like stood by stood by like the front of the theater where they were sitting and there was just, he was just standing there trailers start playing. He like actually tells them, he says like, he says like, all right guys, phones away, watch the movie and then leaves, which, uh, you and I were both security guards for many years. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean a thing. Right. Um, so then like the, the trailers are starting and then they're still doing their thing. They're a little quieter now. And then, then like, I think, I think at that time the movie started playing and then some ladies like sit down and watch the movie nice. like very loud. And I'm like, you are my freaking hero. I'm going to marry you, <laughs> old lady. Um, but then, and then they sat there and they watched the whole movie. I, I was so perplexed by it. Like, <laughs> I don't, this is not their demographic. I don't understand it. Um, and then throughout it, they were still, they were still fidgeting and doing their thing. I like, you remember when we saw Inception, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you remember how we had a bunch of kids at the front? I do. Had that not been like, what was that? Five, six years ago? Mm-hmm. Had that, I was th- I would think that that was the same kids and they were just in a stasis all that time <laughs> and they were just transported back to my theater and multiplied. <laughs> um, cause they were doing the same thing. I don't understand it. Why do kids have to get up, walk around, talk to each other? It's like, I don't, un- I just don't understand it. I don't get it either. Just watch the movie. You paid. 11 12 bucks to see this movie like why are you not sitting there watching it it's like ah so finally like a guy a guy sitting like kind of behind them like shushed them and told them to sit down and watch the movie but they don't listen because i mean they're unsupervised kids they're not gonna listen to a stranger um it was just it was just so weird i just didn't understand it at all um 
But having said all of that, <laughs> the movie was actually quite good. Good. Um, yeah, uh, Clint Eastwood, I, <sighs> I was not a fan of American Sniper. We talked about it on the podcast. I just was not. I did not like that movie at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of went in with Sully with fairly low expectations. We've talked about my expectations for Sully in past episodes. So when watching it, a few things stuck out to me. One is that Tom Hanks is a freaking legend. He's just amazing at this type of role, um, at every role he tackles, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, the terminal notwithstanding, but that's neither here nor there. (laughs) But um, he, like he he he's car he's carving a niche in his career where he's playing these um, traumatic characters like Captain Phillips. I'm thinking of right, and like he he plays the um, shocked survivor, riddled with guilt kind of kind of character in this in this movie really well. And what I came away from this movie is that it is a really interesting depiction of what happens when, when we question, um, when people in a place of authority or, or when people second guess a person's actions and what that, what that does to the psyche of the person who, who was involved in, in uh, what, what saved many people's lives. Um, and it paints Sully in a very in a very nice light and everything, which I didn't I didn't pay attention to any of the stories or anything. I don't know anything about the guy, but what I what I really liked about it was uh, a couple things. One, what I just said about him kind of grappling with with his choice because it's not he doesn't he doesn't take on this he uh, this hero role with any type of you know um, attention seeking or anything like that. He like throughout the movie he is he is traumatized by like wondering like what if what if what he did didn't work like what if what if he ha- what if he could like the whole kind of crux of the movie is that um i think the ntsb or, or some some type of federal board is um is investigating his his role in 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 the movie and they claim that he could have made it back in time to to a uh, to a uh, a runway um, so he didn't have to do it. So the entire emotional arc of the movie is that he's, he's struggling with real, like wondering, could he have saved, could he have, could he have done it? Um, uh, could he have done it in a less dangerous manner? Mm-hmm. And that type of story is really powerful. And there are also some really, some really, um, some really intense images of, of what his first of all, the opening scene of the movie is a dream sequence of him, um, of him playing out in his head, what could have happened. And the imagery of that is essentially he's like in his head. It's like the opening scene of the movie is him, uh, deciding to fly back to an airport and the imagery of seeing a plane, a passenger airliner flying through New York city, like at very low altitudes and, and, uh, throughout the city, it's like, that's, that's, I don't, I don't know if this is something that everyone that us as a society collectively, or those of us who, who witnessed, um, who, who were old enough to, to really take in the news, the news, uh, um, segments on nine 11. I don't know if this is a collective thing, but like seeing that type of imagery is like, like it is like it just hits it hit me in like such an emotional place that it's like cuz like we've all seen that we've we've seen that in real life and it's something that's it's a traumatic thing to witness and to see it re to see it done on a film is just is is just it's it's hard to take um and i don't know if i'm really um articulating it that well but it's like it's something that it's not a malicious thing from from clint eastwood it's not an opportunistic thing it's just showing what he is thinking and it's there's some 9 11 um undertones throughout it but it's just it's really shocking to see that type of imagery on a film i think i know what you mean yeah and it's and it's really it's really powerful mm-hmm. uh, um imagery so so yeah so so that imagery that imagery plus the um characterization of sully and uh and the co-pilot uh aaron eckhart was a was great in the movie awesome yeah um with an amazing mustache um 
but that just made for a really a really interesting movie um in my book and uh also really brief too it's only like 92 minutes oh really um yeah which made those kids getting up and moving around all the more frustrating like dude it's not even two hours like (laughs) sit down yeah so yeah anyway um so sully I, i really liked it i don't know i don't know how it'll fare in uh when it comes to uh award season but um i don't it's not even my favorite movie of the or my favorite title of the things that I've watched on this list, but it was it was pretty good. It was surprisingly uh, surprisingly good. Nice. Yep. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. So my next entry uh, on the list is Amanda Knox, the documentary uh, on Netflix right now. Nice. Did it um came out this it, year? Did in, it uh, tiny tiny in 2016? But um, did it did it Amanda Knox your socks off? <sighs> You know, uh, listeners, we were he was this was originally going to be his number one thing, but I had to Amanda Knox it down to number two. So how yeah, was Amanda Knox tiny? <laughs> you did. I did. Uh it did not Amanda Knox my socks off. Interesting. Yeah. Um I think Netflix is kind of riding the high of making a murder. And so they're like, you know, let's put some other true crime stuff out there and see how it flies. And and you know, this was an incredibly popular story at the time so you know they're tapping into that as well people's memories of this actual event that was a national story and a big deal so uh i'm I'm not accusing netflix of cash grabbing or anything like that Mm -hmm. um but i feel like it was kind of an opportune time to have this drop if you will sure um and again there's nothing wrong with that maybe it was just good timing um but amanda knox the documentary is about Amanda Knox, which if you do not remember, she was uh, uh, an exchange student living in Italy and she was uh, accused of murdering her um, uh, roommate, who was also a foreign exchange student from uh, Great Britain. Mm -hmm. This was back in 2007. Um, And she was on trial in Italy. Um, And it became one of those really, those really popular. I don't know court what you, cases. Yeah, a real popular yeah. court case, but like it's it was a media story. It was hmm. uh it hit the zeitgeist. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It just became really popular. People latched onto it and they wanted to know every single detail about what happened and it turned into this big media storm. Uh and everyone followed it and she was torn down and built back up and I didn't pay attention to it. I'll put it that way. Sure. Um, I never pay attention to those things. Mm-hmm. I know these people's names because they get mentioned a million times, but I, I just, I don't know. I don't follow this stuff because I think it's, I think it's antithetical to a good, t- to knowing the true story. And I don't, I just don't, I'm not a fan of it because in this documentary, the, the lead investigative journalist, um, who was a British journalist, he was interviewed for this and he kept saying that people were accusing him and the rest of the media of um, basically putting Amanda Knox on trial through mm-hmm. tabloids and through the news. Um, and he tried to defend himself and I, I did not, um, I, I did not think he, he did a very good job. <laughs> That's why I don't like this stuff is because I feel like we get all this disinformation and all this speculation and all this, frankly, bull about all these these people and what they did and what they're like and what they're actually thinking in real life it's all just speculation and it's just made up and it's it's nancy grace you just throw something out there and if it sticks it sticks and people run with it and then that's who that person is now and i hate that it's just it's it's dishonest and it's disingenuous and i hate it um sorry so i don't follow these things in real life i did not know anything about amanda knox and her story i just knew that she was a person who existed um that's all i knew so it it was interesting because they interviewed her for this documentary like she's really she's there yeah her and her uh her boyfriend in quotes uh basically (laughs) the guy she was kind of sleeping with in italy uh they'd only been together for like a week and he got caught up in all this and he did a lot of jail time as well wow um so they interviewed her they interviewed her boyfriend they interviewed the lead detective they interviewed the lead journalist from the bbc i mean they just they interviewed this was like cut to the core like they didn't i really i was really impressed with that you know they got all these people to participate in this and they didn't it had a very raw feel to it for that reason. Um, 
but I I did not feel the intrigue in this case, if you will. Mm-hmm. I think when we were watching Making a Murderer and some of these, other, like, you know, the O.J. Simpson trial and all those big things, there's a did they or didn't they thing, and people mm-hmm. people will flip-flop because of the new information that comes out, and, ooh, there's this new piece of evidence, and the glove did not fit, you must quit, and all that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, it's that's intriguing, I think, after the fact. Like I said, I don't get into that in the moment because I think it's a bunch of crap. Mm-hmm. But I did I did not feel the intrigue in this case. I was like, I, I mean, I really don't think she did this. I mean, looking at all the evidence, I mean, she's a little bit weird and maybe a little bit uh, inappropriate. But um, I, she doesn't strike me as a murderer, and like the evidence doesn't really make it seem like she did it. Um, I think the police kind of came up with the narrative really quickly, and they just decided to stick with it, even though after a while it stopped making sense. And so the detective was very emphatic in the in the documentary as he was being interviewed that she did it. Um, hmm. But I feel like the evidence that came up later on was like, I, th- I think, I think you're really stretching there, buddy. <laughs> um, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't a super intriguing, uh, documentary in, in, in my, or the case wasn't intriguing. I'll put it that way, but the documentary spun it pretty well and it okay. was, it, it was definitely interesting and I, I did enjoy it. So you just weren't that interested in the subject matter? Yeah, the case itself okay. was was just uh, at least when I saw the evidence laid out, I was like, yeah, I don't think she did it, but you know, she's she's kind of dumb and she could have <laughs> she could have done things differently and sure. But ultimately, I think she was a victim because she she mm. served like three years, five years, wow. um, and <clears throat> I mean, she she got caught up in this this thing and it plagued her for See, almost a decade. Wow. See, I I never really followed it or anything. Yeah. So. Going into it, do you think I would be interested in it? Does, does it present everything in a linear fashion for someone who is unfamiliar with the case? It does. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I've been on this kick lately, or I guess it's just things that are popular right now are about the concept of justice and the mm-hmm. justice system and all that. And I've laid out my opinions on that. And I have repeatedly used the phrase, a scathing indictment of the justice system. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's... It's kind of refreshing to see that it's not just the American justice system, because <laughs> right. uh, this takes place in Italy, and it's a freaking mess hmm. for eight years. It's a ridiculous mess, um, and I'm glad to see that it's not just the U.S. Maybe just the concept of justice in general hmm. is a flawed concept. Uh, maybe that's what all these true crime stories are really telling us. But uh, again, that's speculation, which I'm not a fan of. <laughs> so I, I do recommend seeing it. It's 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 pretty short. It goes pretty quick. I think they could have turned this into like a two hour movie or even like a three part series or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's about ninety minutes, and uh, I feel like they covered pretty much everything. I mean, yeah, they could have fleshed some more things out and maybe interviewed some additional people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a pretty solid documentary. And again. Thank you, Netflix, for being dedicated to that genre, because right. I'm a pretentious douche who loves them. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, nothing. Um, well, that's cool. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's um, cool. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So I'll go ahead and uh, bring up a couple more that I've seen lately. Um, <clears throat> for my turn, I these are a couple more um, theater viewings. First up is... The remake of The Magnificent Seven. And speaking of being a pretentious douche, um, back when I was in high school, I was a huge fan of the movie Seven Samurai because I was like 15 and no one else liked old Japanese samurai movies, so I wanted to be special. <laughs> um, but uh, that movie that movie holds up to me. Like I, I just recently rewatched it after seeing The Magnificent Seven, and I still love it. It's It's really amazing it it's it's still up there for me mm-hmm. um just the characterization of it, it's i don't know i can't anyway i watched the magnificent seven <laughs> um which is a remake of the magnificent seven which is a remake of seven samurai um and you know it's this movie stars denzel washington chris pratt um uh peter sarsgaard as the villain uh Ethan Hawke. There's a lot of people in this movie and there's the Magnificent Seven themselves are like a, a very diverse group, which is great. Like I I love that there, I love that there can be a movie with, um, that's a Western that has a lot of different ethnicities throughout, throughout its titular Magnificent Seven. 
um, and it not be a big point of contention with with people in in uh, real life. Um, right. So having said that, it was just it was an interesting movie because. I watched it and I enjoyed myself quite a bit. I, I enjoyed the movie for what it was, but there was not much of any substance throughout it at all. Mm. Um, it's very, it's very much a kind of uh, bland manufactured movie. That's essentially just like, okay, well let's hit the Western, not cliches, but let's hit the, the Western trademarks to make a, to make a Western movie and uh we've got Chris Pratt so let's do let's give him as much Chris Pratty things to do and not worry about like actually developing his character let's just have him do his Chris Pratt Pratt thing and uh you know it was i don't know it was it was just okay i enjoyed it for the most part cuz i think that i'm just a big fan of the western aesthetic and like cuz i mean it's it's you know it's it's a town They've got like the classic like kind of storefronts and um, um, that's in like a classic classic Western town. It was basically like they looked at Red Dead Redemption or Tombstone and was like, okay, let's just do that. Let's make that yeah. the set. Um, and Peter Sarsgaard is all over the place. That you don't get much of it. Like he's just okay. He's just an evil guy for the sake of being evil. Um, and he's just like, there's nothing, nothing beneath his evilness to give him any sort of dimension. So having said all that, like it's the makings of a bad movie, but I still enjoyed myself because I like that Western aesthetic and the final battle sequence. You you know that this is the story. This is the story that's been repeated over and over again. Seven Samurai started it. Um, the Magnificent Seven, uh, A Bug's Life, <laughs> um, Saving Private Ryan. It's all the same type of thing. And you know this leading up to a big action set piece at the end, and it didn't disappoint for the most part. Um, I will say that one of the one of the Magnificent Seven is uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. No clue what the hell he's doing in this movie. Oh, really? It's so weird. The, he puts these weird affectations on his on his voice and and in his performance. He's got this really. I didn't get what that character was supposed to be. Like it was, it was such a weird character. And such a weird turn that's not given any any sort of context, and it's 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 as random as possible because he pretty much pops up at a very random moment, and it's like uh, okay, like I I couldn't even catch up with like okay, they were looking for this guy because there's they just had this whole conversation with these two other guys. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about, and then suddenly oh, there's Kingpin from Daredevil. <laughs> um, and it's it's just like it was so it was so out of left field. So I kind of wonder if maybe there is this alternate cut, this director's cut that's like an extra hour worth of movie that's more set up and everything. But um the actual action at the end was fun. I I enjoyed watching, you know, all the shoot 'em ups and everything. <laughs> um all the shoot 'em ups and everything. And I don't know. And there there was one thing that it was like blatantly like, okay, uh, hey, um, uh, Saving Private Ryan kind of, you know, applied this story, this type of story to, uh, World War II. And they did this really cool thing in the, in that movie. Let's, let's use this for this. And which I don't mind, but it just made me think of how great Saving Private Ryan is. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, Magnificent Seven was, it was pretty fun. I wouldn't say go see it in the theater. Um, I'd say rent it or stream it if it hits Netflix or something. Okay. Um, That's a shame. I yeah. mean, I, I was never very enthusiastic about the movie, but it mm -hmm. doesn't mean I wanted it to be bad. I mm -hmm. liked all the people involved. Zell is a legend mm -hmm. in my book. And he's and, and he's really good at playing the kind of grizzled gunslinger guy. He's a bounty hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't have that much to do. There's There's some backstory that gets resolved, like, in the... In the kind of, like most perfunctory way possible i i would say mm -hmm. um or it's like just it reaches its expected conclusion and it's just like okay uh okay maybe if yeah. you developed it more and built it up more that would be good but i don't know that's a shame yeah so that's magnificent seven if it's available on streaming when it hits home video maybe check it out in the background okay um i have a bit of a soft spot for antoine Foucault too 
Yeah. Just because Training Day is just mm-hmm. like a, such a great movie, but I, he's been kind of riding the coattails of that a little bit. He ever has. since, and that's, I hate saying that, but I mean, I think, I think Shooter was a cool movie too. I really mm-hmm. like that movie, but it's, it's not Training Day. Right. So that's a shame. Yep. Yep. Um, oh, oh, also, uh, yeah, the Magnificent, my, my biggest gripe about Magnificent Seven is, and this is something I didn't really realize how much I missed it until I rewatched Seven Samurai. Because the whole idea of this, of this movie, this plot is that these, these gunslingers, th- these different, these, this very ragtag group that kind of comes together, um, in service to this town that needs their, that needs their protection. Like there's a nobility to that. And I, I really like the, I really like that story. Like, and I think that's why I had fun with this movie is that just in any, in any, um, setting this story is a movie, a storyline that I just love. I, I just flat out love this type of story. Right. And one of my biggest gripes with Magnificent Seven is that it doesn't have much of any interaction between the townspeople and the, in the, in the, in the seven at all. Hmm. It's like there's some, there's some sequences of them training them to fight, but it's like there's no, there's no like, like in Seven Samurai, one of the samurai falls in love with one of the one of one of the uh, farmer's daughters, and there's a lot of things with with different characters interacting with different different farmers in it. And there's a lot of stuff about how the farmers are terrified of um, the samurai because they don't know what they're going to do or anything. And they, like when they're on their way there, like there's an amazing sequence in Seven Samurai where one of the farmers. Um, basically forces his daughter to chop off her hair like forcibly forcibly cuts off her hair because he doesn't want the samurai to come and rape her um when when they get there or see that she's a beautiful young woman and uh and and all that it's just it it, it, there's so much there and there's like nothing of the sort of of that there's no there's no interaction there's hardly any interaction between the the farmers or, or the uh the townspeople and and the magnificent seven in this movie and it's it's such a drag it was it was that was a letdown dang that sucks yeah okay so should i go ahead and move on to our my next one sure sweet so this movie okay deep water horizon uh mark Wahlberg and uh uh peter berg movie about the um bp oil spill and I had my reservations going in because Peter Berg, I love the guy's work in the kingdom and, uh, Friday night lights. Um, but lone survivor was really, it's, it's kind of funny because first of all, Peter Berg, his previous movie was lone survivor. Clint Eastwood's previous movie was, uh, American sniper and their current movies now both competing in the same, uh, same awards year is are both movies about, a recent um a recent event i don't want to say historical but um a recent event that gained a lot of media attention sully and uh deep water horizon mm-hmm. but deep water horizon is about the biggest oil spill catastrophe in 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 history and uh coming off a of lone survivor i was not sure what to expect with this movie and I have to say it was pretty incredible. I actually really loved it. Nice. Um yeah, it was I it starts out with this weird um not weird, but this very very cliched like um Mark Wahlberg family man uh uh thing where his daughter's like the cutest little girl ever and she's super into into the oil drilling and stuff. And she's working on a project for school. So she's going to basically explain his entire job to the audience in this really cute thing. But from there, once they get on like deep water horizon and you see first the scale of it, um, like it's, it's, it's breathtaking. It's, they captured like what a feat of human, uh, ingenuity this, this was, and this is, it's like, it's, it's breathtaking. Wow. And, uh, and it's, once you're there, it's, it's amazing to me because it spends so much time basically going through everything. It doesn't like hold your hand through everything. Like I have no idea what the hell a kill pump is or kill drill is or whatever it is, but they talk about it. Like they're talking, they're talking about it in, in dialogue. And it's not like something that's like stopping and 
like explaining to the audience like okay this is what this means this is what this means it's just kill line that's what it was um okay um it's some some drilling thing but we know what's going on and we know that it's about to you know everything's about to go south but it it doesn't just jump into the action and to say action is kind of a misnomer or not misnomer but it's uh i don't mean to be disrespectful because it's a terrible event but like it doesn't jump into the into into the tragedy immediately like you get time to really understand the dynamics between these characters these people and uh the conflict between the bp oil men and and the drill people and like it's very obviously the movie is very one-sided on one on one side of it or it's very much geared toward one line of thinking which i didn't mind i don't i didn't really follow this event that closely but uh once everything goes south and once everything happens it's like it's it's really kind of like the kind of like how i described the imagery in sully it's like not mesmerizing it's it's terrifying it's it's terrifying on a deep level because you know like you see you see exact like you see the scope of what happened and the scale of what happened in the um helplessness of these of these people and you see what happened as it unfolded and it's like there are numerous times where you're like i like i was sitting there thinking like i don't know how anyone in this in this in this event survived <laughs> anything um it's just it's it's really amazing and it it really brings home just the amount of tragedy that this was or the 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 scope of how tragic and and terrible this this thing was um and it was it was really well done um from a filmmaking perspective because peter burke was just did an amazing job capturing all of that and um and there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, John Malkovich is in it and he's, he plays this really good, like sniveling, um, corporate a-hole, uh, cause he's John Malkovich. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, Kurt Russell's in it and he's, he's great. He's, he's Kurt Russell, man. I, he's I like him. one of my number one guilty pleasure actors. He's, he's one of my just favorite actors. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, That's yeah. all. I, I respect that. He's awesome. Yeah. And there is a, there's a moment, there are a few moments in, uh, kind of, at at certain points of the movie where Mark Wahlberg is like, he is, he's just on fire. Like he is fantastic in this movie. And like, there are moments where I, like I almost like choked up and I almost like was just, I was almost crying in the theater. Wow. It was like, it was really powerful. Um, the way that everything kind of comes together and, and you kind of, you reach moments that are just like packed with an emotional punch. And it, it just, it's really, it's really amazing. It's, I don't know how high I, I don't know if it would be it will I'll say this it it may it may crack my top 10 uh, nice. at a pretty hell elevated level on it. Wow. Yep. I am really glad to hear that. Yeah, me too. I was really glad to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh so yeah, so tiny I've been talking a lot and my voice is hoarse. <laughs> um what's your next one? Uh my next one is uh from 2008. It was the uh the Oscar winner for best documentary, uh, Man on Wire, uh, mm-hmm. directed by uh, James Marsh, and it chronicles the uh, what some people refer to as the artistic crime of the century. Uh, back in 1974, a uh, French tightrope walker named uh, Philippe Petit mm-hmm. uh, decided, not just decided, he had like basically a lifelong dream from when he was a child or a teenager uh, to walk a tightrope across the twin towers in New York city of the world trade center. Um, and it's really, this documentary is great because you have present day interviews with everyone who was involved. I mean, Philippe Petit and you know, it wasn't just him who, who, uh, who did this feat. He had a whole team who helped him. Um, and all those people are interviewed and they tell us their feelings and some of them are French. One guy's Australian. There's a couple American guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has this, this really cool international feel to it. Um, and it's, it's amazing because it features those, those present day interviews, but it's interspersed with footage and photographs from 1974 when he pulled off this feat. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like, you know, Philippe and his friends 
were savvy enough to have uh, a camera around for a lot of the the preparations and the actual event itself but they're not they're not those type of artists to where they can make it a they can make a documentary or make a film about it mm-hmm. um and so thankfully uh James Marsh came along and was like let's turn this into a movie and good idea because he won an Oscar for it <laughs> um so i i really loved the juxtaposition of how you know Philippe Philippe Petit is talking about how he felt in in certain moments and his friends are describing the expressions on his face and then you get to see a picture of it and you're just you're really transported back to the actual event itself um and it's just really amazing how the city of New York reacted to it you know it was very very public it wasn't just publicized in the, in New York City I didn't realize it was like reported around the world I mean Philippe right. Petit's name appeared in like a hundred different newspapers around the world wow and uh there's pictures of him uh that appeared in newspapers all around the world uh, walking the tire up in between the two towers um it's i didn't realize the scope and the reach of that event and uh i i'm glad i i'm glad someone documented it for our generation and for generations to come in a in a really good documentary like this um another really cool thing about it is through some they do some uh uh, dramatizations, some recreations of, of actual events and, and they're done really well. I think they did a good job. Um, and, and through that and through like the storytelling from Philippe Petit, he's a very animated guy. He's just, he's like a character in and of himself. He's super cool. Um, his English is incredibly good. I was really impressed with his English. Nice. Um, and so he's very animated and he, he's actually very descriptive and has an incredible vocabulary from somebody from France telling a story in English. Um, <laughs> It feels like he's he's telling you a story about a heist. It's it's a heist story because <laughs> That's awesome. what they did is incredibly illegal. They basically <laughs> broke into the World Trade Center while it was still under construction mm-hmm. partially. It was only partially occupied by businesses at the time. Wow. And they they basically broke into the World Trade Center and strung up a wire overnight and he broke the law. I mean, <laughs> the, the, he, it was it's a legal thing for him to do. Um and so it's it's just amazing that they pulled it off. It it, it really is like you think it might be kind of not that difficult to just kind of sneak a wire up, you mm-hmm. know, up the top of a building and you walk across it. Like it doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you think about all the details involved, all the physics, you're talking about this wire weighs like a couple hundred pounds. Mm-hmm. And how do you, it's the, the, the towers spanned 200 feet across from each other. Mm-hmm. How do you get that wire from one building to the other? That's the logistics of it are yeah. just, I, I, it's not something yeah. I really thought about. And then I'm like, yeah. how did they do that? You know? <laughs> and then when you walk a tightrope, I didn't know this, it has to be stabilized through mm-hmm. like a guy wire. So like the wires you see holding up your telephone poles and stuff, you know, there's, it's called a guy wire. Mm-hmm. You have to have that with a tightrope because if you don't, there's so many different movements involved with a wire. It, you know, it goes up and down and side to side and it can spin at certain times. And the, the wire itself actually kind of, it's like a torsion move. The wire itself will like twist okay. uh, with different pressure. So you have to have a guy wire on it or it's literally impossible to walk across it. And so they had to find a way to anchor it at different points. So there's just so much involved. It's just huh. there's so many details. They It took them an entire night to get it all rigged up. Wow. Um, so I was just super impressed with like kind of the heist nature of it. It's a bit of bias on my part because I like heist movies and heist mm-hmm. stories, bank robberies and stuff like that. I think those are really fun. Um, and it had that feel to it. So that really appealed to me. Um, and then again, just Philippe Petit is a really cool guy. I, mm-hmm. I, I wish he was famous for more so we could see him do more things. <laughs> uh, cause he's just a really, I, I like him. Like I want to meet him and have a conversation with him. I think it'd be fun. Um, I really, one of my goals, I really wanted to do a, uh, I just kind of watched this on a whim on like a Thursday night. Mm-hmm. I, before the weekend was over and we got to this recording tonight, I really wanted to watch The Walk. I was going to ask you from I, Robert Zemeckis yeah. that came out last year, the year uh, before. I think it was a year before maybe. Yeah. Or it might have been last year. I'm not sure. So I really wanted to watch that and do like a double feature, but mm-hmm. I just didn't have time. Yeah. I was out of town for a lot of the weekend and I just, I couldn't squeeze it in, but, um, Seeing this documentary really makes me want to see that movie. Nice. I wanted to see it anyways because it's Joseph Gordon Levitt mm-hmm. and Robert Zemeckis is a remarkably visual director. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was excited. I, I'm excited to see it for that reason. Um, but this made me 
I want to see it even more. So this is a really great documentary. It's on Netflix. Um, I highly recommend it. It's Oscar winning documentary and it's not that long. It's only like, I think it's just, you know, good old 90 minutes. It's nothing, it's nothing crazy. Yeah. Hour 34. So I, I recommend it. It was a lot of fun. Nice. And that's on, that's on Netflix currently. Yes, sir. Sweet. Yeah. I wanted to watch that and watch the walk also, but I, I haven't gotten around to either of them. So yeah, uh, I will keep my eye out on that. Cool. Okay. So moving on to mine, I'm, I'm going to do this, this first one really briefly. Um, cause I talked about Bosch a few weeks ago on the podcast. Um, I watched season one. It's on Amazon prime. It's an Amazon prime original with Titus Welliver and, uh, um, Ah, oh, the dude, dude that played Marlo in, in The Wire. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't remember his name. Jamie Hector. Um, and also just some other actors also, obviously. Um, Lance Reddick is in it. Um, anyway, um, I watched season two and, um, I, I'll just be really brief on it because I've, I've lauded my praise upon Bosch season one and season two is just as good. Um, I don't know if I don't, well, there are certain elements of it that I think are better than the first season. I really, I really loved, I really enjoyed this season of Bosch season two. And there is one plot element. Um, there's one, there's a plot line in season, in season two of Bosch that is very much, um, you kind of expect where it's going to head and what's, what's going to happen. Um, but even though you see it coming when it happens, like there's such a really great, um, from an artistic level, um, such a great, uh, depiction of it or depiction of the fallout from it. It's like, it's not, it's something that you're, you're tensing up for, you're, you're nervous about, but like the fallout from it is like really, really, um, nuanced in, and, and there's a lot of emotional fallout to it, um, to this, this little event that's just takes up a, a small plot line of, of the season. Um, I was really, I was really, I was, I really appreciated the way that they handled certain things in the season of Bosch. Um, and also, uh, tiny, the, the guy that played, um, uh, was it Billings or Billings Billings in, uh, in the shield? Oh yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he pops up as a detective Nice. and it, it freaked me out a little bit. Cause I was like, like he's, he's playing like a competent detective, <laughs> um, like a really, like he's, he's good at his job and it's just so weird. Cause in the shield, he plays this kind of joke of a detective or this guy who I think one of his early scenes in season four of the shield was he talks about how he has like some ridiculous amount of months. And he's like, Oh yeah, I have like, you know, here in, here in another like 64 months or something, I, I can get, I can retire something ridiculous like yeah. that. So he's like kind of a half end detective in the shield. But here in Bosch, it's, it's kind of, it's essentially the same type. It, it's a, it's a detective character, but he's, um, he's competent. He's good at his job. It's just, it was just a weird mind trip. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's Bosch season two. He was in Homeland as well. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. He was, he was fun to watch in that show. Nice. Cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was, uh, Bosch season two. It's on Amazon Prime. I'm looking forward to season three. I think that they've been releasing the seasons in like February. So hopefully this February they'll, uh, uh, release season three. And, uh, so my next one is, uh, The Birth of a Nation, which Tiny, have you, are you familiar with this movie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've seen the trailers and stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, Nate Parker's, um, Nat Turner biopic. Mm hmm. Um, Nate Parker, from what I understand, wrote, directed, and stars in it wow. as Nat Turner, um, a, a slave who, a preacher who led an uprising. I really don't know uh, basically anything about that real life story. I'm woefully undereducated on it. So was I. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll say that I was really looking forward to this movie. I was kind of, I know that it got some really good, um, reviews out of, I think, Sundance or, um, I think it was Sundance and I was really eager for it because our, one of our favorite movies of the past several years was 12 years of slave mm-hmm. of the past few years. And, uh, I was kind of thinking it would be something in, in the, the similar vein, something emotionally arresting like that, mm-hmm. something that's like just really remarkable. And a good part of the movie was for me, um, it kind of suffers by being 
by falling into being just a straight biopic sort of. Okay. Um, cause you kind of follow Nat Turner as he, as he's a child up until, you know, he, he stages his rebellion and it's the, <sighs> The pieces are there. The pieces are there for them for them to um really build up like like what led to him leading this, but it it doesn't seem as emotionally resonant or as emotionally gripping as it could. It seems more like this weird um collection of not vignettes but like little bits and pieces here and there like he like he witnesses this thing or there's there's one thing that he witnesses and or this one thing that he that happens and then and then it's kind of presented as like these pieces are are what ultimately made him become this leader of of slaves to to you know kill their their slave owners and um stage this huge rebellion which like if if it had really um taken more time to develop those the characters and and those interactions that led to that it would have been i mean this would have been in a freaking incredible movie um but as it is it just kind of felt a little not hollow or empty but it felt like it felt like there just wasn't enough there at a character level to really guide us through um Nat Turner's thought process and, and his his journey mm. okay throughout. yeah well that's a shame it is it is and then also just a, a little anecdote i guess um the theater that i that i went to to see this they recently um uh, put reclining reclined seating in the theaters um mm-hmm. here in the west side tiny charlotte and i think we talked about it before but they also did reserve seating and reserve seating is interesting yeah um especially when you go to the movie theater alone so like I get like last last row middle seat exactly, and it's like I don't know how I feel about reserved seating on like busy theaters because I like going to like matinees where I have like my own space and everything. Um, so like I go I go and I like there's like three people like in the seats right next to me and like it's cl- kind of close to the theater to the movie starting to the preview starting. So I'm like you know what. As a courtesy, I'm just gonna have I'm gonna have a a buffer seat between them because I'm I'm not with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like halfway through the trailers, I see like a few people come up and I'm like, oh, they must have gotten seats one through three. So I was like, are you guys in one through three? And they're like, yeah. I was like, oh yeah, sorry about that. I'll get in my seat. So like I'm there, and then I felt kind of uncomfortable because I'm awkward. Yeah, because are. I am because <laughs> it's a it's a row of like seven seats. To my left are are three people. To my right are 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 three people and like i'm i'm just a white guy in the middle of of like a bunch of of black people with this movie and it's not and so it just felt like really uncomfortable and everything just for a moment and then i was like yeah i don't care it's i mean it's nothing i mean it's a movie or whatever i just kind of felt like my white guilt was like really it was like like oh god uh like um yeah but i can understand that yeah, but there was something, there was something in the movie that it kind of, and then this is something that's like kind of more political or not something that's under our purview at all. But, um, I thought it was interesting that throughout the movie, first of all, throughout the movie, the people to the left of me, it was like, I believe it was a man and, and two of his sons. I'm almost positive. Um, throughout the whole movie, like he took his phone out and was like looking at it. And I'm like, dude, and like showing his son's things. And I'm like, dude the light man i didn't yeah. say anything but i, I kind of wish i would have um but then like <laughs> there was a moment where um uh, a character says a character says that they're killing black people just for being black mm-hmm. um at a certain point um and then like i heard him whisper to them saying like just like today and i'm like i was like man like that that made me feel really uncomfortable. I bet. And then I was just like, that's, I don't know. That's just, it made me uncomfortable. And it kind of made me think like, that's, that that's a bummer for, you know, yeah. just our, the state of our society today that, um, I mean, I know that's a very small sampling, right. but it's also like, I don't, from the way the media portrays everything, that seems to be, you know, a common, uh, thought that's shared. Yeah. And I have no way of, like, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm a 
f- white guy. <laughs> I have no frame of reference for this at all. And I come from a police family too. So that's also, I, I have my biases or, or I have my, I have a completely different, um, upbringing and lifestyle in, in life, uh, from which to, to perceive, uh, what's going on in our world today. And it's just, it's, it's such, it's such a bummer that we live in a world like that where that's like a legitimate feeling that people have. Right. And it's, it's a shame. Not to say that he's right or wrong. It's just right. the fact that he has to feel that way is a bummer. Right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. As soon as those credits rolled, I ran the hell out of that place. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. But yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if that was just a weird experience and I'm, I don't know how that's going to sound. when well, I, I mean, it was I part of your movie going experience. It's not, you know, it's, it's what you felt. It's what you went through. It's that's a true. genuine thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but so that so that was a bummer, but also the movie so so to actually bring it back, the movie was uh it was okay. I it was okay. I just kind of feel like it it was a little um it was a it was a little confined to the biopic format and and that kind of took me out of it a little bit. Gotcha. So yeah, um Jackie Earl Haley is in it and he was he was really good and uh menacing. Nice. Yeah. But but yeah. He's very good at that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cool. So, uh, Tiny, do you want to give us your last one for the episode? Absolutely. Uh, I was really excited to bring this movie up. This is from 2013, uh, the movie Begin Again, mm-hmm. uh, directed by John Carney. Uh, just a brief synopsis. I'll, I'll read the IMDb synopsis. synopsis. Uh, a chance encounter between a disgraced music business executive and a young singer-songwriter new to Manhattan turns into a promising collaboration between the two talents. Um. So that sounds like a bit of a formulaic kind of standard uh, pretext for a story. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in a way it is. But what I love about this movie is that it's a movie about music mm-hmm. more than anything. And I think that's really hard to do because you're melding two mediums in which to express art. And, and that goes wrong a lot. That's, you think certain themes and ideas will transfer between the two mediums, but they just really don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's a dangerous thing to undertake. Um, but I'm really happy to report that J- John Carney just absolutely nailed this movie. Nice. I, I, uh, I tweeted about it and, uh, I used a phrase that every scene is dripping with charm. <laughs> this whole movie was so charming. And just really cute and enchanting in, in so many ways. Um, through the characters, which I feel like they all had really good chemistry, um, was, was one of the best outlets for, for all that majesty, if you will. Um, the movie stars Mark Ruffalo and Kira Knightley as the two main characters. Um, Mark Ruffalo playing the, the music producer and Kira Knightley, the singer songwriter. Um, and, and they're, they're both just magnificent together, which I, I, would have expected nothing less. I, I think they're they're two of the best working actors right now. I that that didn't surprise me at all. Um, what did surprise me was some of the supporting cast. Um, Haley Steinfeld plays the daughter of Mark Ruffalo. Oh, nice. Um, she had a limited role, sort of, but she became important later on in the movie, and uh, I I appreciated what what she did and how she interacted with Keira Knightley and and uh, Mark Ruffalo. She did a great job. Um, and then some of the more surprising roles were uh, James Corden, who uh, recently oh, yeah. took over hosting one of the late night shows. Um, I don't follow those, so I, I don't know which one he has. But um, he I mean, was in he, Doctor Who. Yeah, he was in Doctor Who. Right. Yeah. He was he was an actor before that, and he was a comedian, and so he has you know he has a basis in this stuff, and he was so charming. He was like so nice. so fun, and him. It felt like he and Kira Knightley were brother and sister and they've oh, yeah? known each other for 30 years. Like that's what it felt <laughs> like. And I was like, awesome. I was impressed that they could pull that off. Um, cause I, you know, for currently, I just don't think of him as an actor, even though that's the first time I was ever introduced to him was in Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I just think of him, think of him as a late night host now. And that's, you know, he's more than that. And I'm, I'm really glad. Um, also, Adam Levine was in this movie. Oh yeah, and that dude can act. Really? I mean, he was keeping up with Keira Knightley. Huh. I, I was I was really impressed by Adam Levine's acting ability. Um, and 
I, I, I was just so surprised. I, I, I have no basis for who Adam Levine is. I mean, I've, I, you know, I heard Maroon 5 songs back in the day and Maroon 5 is fun. You know, it's, they're a good band or whatever. Um, kind of poppy and popular. So mm-hmm. the, he just never really stuck out to me. He's on the voice and stuff and he was like, the best looking man of the year a couple of years ago. I, I just don't really know anything about the guy. Um, it kind of sounds like you know a lot about the guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I, I have no I'm grasp joking. on what kind of person he is. That's what I mean. Sure. And, and like, just like, I mean, you're just saying like, oh, he was like the most, most handsome guy in the world. For like <laughs> year. He's in Maroon 5 on The Voice. Yeah. I, I, I've never bought any Adam Levine albums. I don't have any Maroon 5 albums. I don't watch The Voice. I don't read tabloids. Sure. So I okay. just don't have a very good grasp on what kind of guy he is. And so I, <laughs> I didn't really have an opinion on him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but after this movie, he's, that dude is ridiculously talented. Nice. Um, and he's so hot. <laughs> he is. That dude, like, <laughs> I don't, he probably slept with every woman on the, in the movie because he's just such a good Christ. looking, he's so hot. Um, but he's remarkably talented. He, he's, he plays a musician in the, in the movie. Um, and he, he plays the, the biggest song in the movie, kind of the, mm-hmm. the movie that plays through, it's kind of a, it has a thread throughout the, from the beginning of the first scene all the way to the end. Uh, the song comes up in different spots throughout the movie mm-hmm. in different iterations and he gives kind of the penultimate, or like the ultimate performance of it towards the end of the movie. And like, it just, I was like glued to the screen. It was, it's such a great song. Um, as soon as the movie ended, I went to iTunes and bought it. Nice. And I've listened to it about a dozen times in the last 24 hours since I saw this movie. <laughs> um, so the cast all did a magnificent job and I was really pleased with everybody. But the standout of this, of this movie is the music. Mm-hmm. I mean, they wrote, they wrote songs just for the movie and there's a whole soundtrack just for the movie nice. and uh everyone played their own instruments and sang their own songs um i i would say kira knightley had the greatest undertaking she kind of she and mark ruffalo end up making a record together mm-hmm. recording an album and she has to sing a bunch of songs and i i couldn't tell if she actually did sing them when i was watching the movie but she did uh and that's i had no idea she could sing and she did a really good job um and and the music is all very the 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 movie kind of takes a stance through Mark Ruffalo's character that the music industry is kind of suffering from an artistic standpoint at mm-hmm. the moment all of the what most people would consider to be very quality inspirational artistic music is like you don't really make a lot of money on that anymore. You know, it's the music, modern music industry is all about image and popularity and, you know, you plug lyrics and guitars and drums into a machine and it pops out a song for you. And it's kind Mm -hmm. of all very produced and, and this movie kind of cuts to the, cuts to the roots of where music comes from. And it's not about all that production value. It's about being in the moment and, and, writing a really good song that you actually care about and it's about something it's not just a, a an anthem to some ridiculous notion um so the, the the movie has such a a pure basis in what music should be and 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 how we should all consume music and how it's recorded and and what what our artists really should be like as opposed to you know what we actually get at the at the end of the day when we download a song um so I really respect the movie so much for that stance. And and another great thing about it is they don't take a bunch of obvious turns throughout the movie. Like there's, you know, th- there was a very obvious love story throughout the movie mm-hmm. and they didn't necessarily follow all the beats of that love story. It was very, I don't want to spoil anything because I want people to go see this. It's on Netflix. You can go see it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, they they didn't fall into a bunch of tropes and I think the characters found very very personal paths to take it wasn't it wasn't a recycled recycled easy formulaic movie and and i think all the characters followed their own paths it wasn't it wasn't bottled up like like a lot of music is um and a lot of a lot of movies and stories tend to be um the movie's just really good. I just, I love the music. I, I would have bought the whole album if I wasn't broke right now. I just <laughs> I ended up buying just the song. Sure. Um, 
it's it's just a really really great movie i um i meant to go look back at my 2013 top 10 list mm-hmm. because i think this probably would have made it I, yeah i'd have been shocked if it wouldn't have made my top 10 nice um that's a project that I've I've wanted us to do for yeah, a while. But, yeah, me yeah. too. I think it'd be cool. Yeah. Um and also just do a to- an, uh, podcast episode topic about uh music and movies. Um, well, we did music slash musician movies. We did, oh, but yeah. I mean just like uh, just an episode about the music that's in movies, like specific right. songs and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I would love to do something like that. Mm-hmm. Mention like specific songs and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think this would definitely make that list and be mentioned by me. Mm-hmm. I um, think one of our listeners actually asked if we did that also. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think that'd be a cool exercise. Totally. But yeah, the the movie's so good, and it's 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 got one of those generic posters, like we mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, we've mentioned in the past couple episodes, and the trailers. I saw. I mean, I remember seeing trailers for this. And I remember like Mark Ruffalo coming on the Daily Show and promoting this movie and stuff, mm-hmm. and it just never really caught my attention. It, it has very generic uh, marketing, and it just it it it's really not what you think it is. It's it's a really unique movie, and uh, I'm I'm gonna. I think we also mentioned last week or in the past couple of episodes about how we don't buy as much physical, you know, like Blu-rays and DVDs as we used to. Right. Um. I'm I'm gonna buy this one. Nice. Because it's uh, I'm gonna want to watch it more times and have a physical copy of it and see some uh i want to see some behind the scenes stuff um yeah the there's there's just a moment in the movie where it's you have a reaction to it that you can only get through music through someone like performing a song live and having like a personal connection with an audience and i had i had that experience through a movie like a scene in a movie and it was just like it really just hit me and like I said I've listened to that song like 12 times since nice and I haven't I saw this movie a day ago so wow yeah it's just it really impacted me musically and and mm-hmm. as a as a movie watcher um, nice it's it's really good please go watch it I will have to um, yes have you have you seen Inside Lewin Davis I haven't that's okay. another one I need to see and also there's a movie called Sing Street that you might be into I haven't Sing seen it Street. but um, okay. I've heard that it's similar in vain to that i think okay um so let's see we are how long how deep in this recording are we uh hour 34 oh my god okay well i will go ahead and just say these two things really quickly i don't know if i will or not uh should i just cut it off here uh i'll just say this i watched the night of i watched all of it nice Uh uh-huh and uh you know i i really liked a lot of it Mm -hmm. um I thought that it was a really, like you said, Tiny, it's a really um, kind of intense uh, look at the criminal justice system, every facet of it. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really w- handled well, uh, the way that it kind of showed everything, um, the whole process. Um, there are some things that I just didn't, I felt like it was a little bit padding for me. Mm-hmm. Um, most notably, a lot of the prison stuff, like... I, at the outset, it's it's terrifying that this kid is just awaiting trial and he's taken to Rikers Island, and he's just he's in he's in Gen Pop of of a prison, mm-hmm. and like he has to adapt to that lifestyle, and the in that world and that culture, and he's the shy reserved kid, and uh, that that's really intriguing. That's really um, powerful drama, but the way that it's handled, it's just it seems a little. A little, it se- it seems a little drama driven instead of actually like exploring what that situation would be like. Um, there are some things that are kind of, kind of just like made me more aware that I was watching a TV show than anything. Okay. Um, and then there are some things like uh, with one of the lawyers involved in in the case that kind of just made me, it it kind of made me think like really they're going to go down this route with with this thing and this thing. It's just, I just felt like they, it was a missed opportunity to really take a, a deep, close look at the criminal justice system, um, without resorting to dramatic flourishes to, to pad the, um, narrative. I gotcha. Yeah. And, um, there was also something else about that that I can't, oh, um, at, like in the first or second episode, I think the first episode, uh, one of the first scenes with John Totoro, who was amazing in this, in this season. Or in this in this limited series, um, there's a scene with him and um, Riz Ahmed, 
And he's saying that like he like kind of what I was hoping would be kind of the thesis statement of the of the season or of the show of the story. He says like it doesn't like don't tell me anything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what what happened. What matters is that um, they're going to have their side of the story. Luckily, we have access. We'll have access to it before we have to figure out our side of the story. And I was kind of hoping that that would be kind of the through line throughout the entire thing, um, much like how making a murder a big thing about that was how it was two cases that um, that were trying two two separate cases trying two separate people um, for the same murder, and the narrative for each case was completely conflicting to the other one and just like kind of the mental exercises that goes to like, how can that possibly, how can, how can something like that occur when it's clearly just from the outset, from, from a narrative perspective, like those, those two, those two, um, uh, narratives clash and there's no way that like if both of them not, there's no way that both of them can be correct. So why go to trial with it? So, right. Yeah, so I was kind of hoping that it would kind of dive into that, and it didn't really satisfy that um, that for me. Um, the performances were really great, though. Um, the emphasis on the emphasis on John Turturro's eczema, um, his character's eczema, foot eczema. Um, it was really, I got it, I got it. It's a, it's a metaphor for the criminal justice system and how. Like he's he's going to different doctors and different um, places to get to get treatment for it and taking uh, taking treatment advice from several different outlets all have different ideas because they have different ideas of how to quote unquote fix it. But they've spent like prob- they could have spent like a quarter amount of time on it and have it be this subtle running thing throughout it. But they spent like a ton of time on it. It's like it was kind of beating us over the head. with it. It's like we get it. OK, it's OK. Um, really? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It it just kind of was overdone a little bit. Um, but I mean, this, this mini series, this limited series was compulsively watchable, uh, beautiful to look at, Mm -hmm. um, captured a lot of really great, um, it, it made really dynamic. Um, it, it made what could have been boring sets and, and boring situations like a court, um, it made it look like just really beautiful and, and really uh, spectacular. Um, but at the end of the day, I was kind of, I don't know, I was kind of not let down by it. I thought that it was really good. It just wasn't quite what I was hoping it would be. Um, yeah. So, so that, that's what I thought of the night of. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, but, and this will round out the six extended potpourri, um, but kind of the reason why, <laughs> Um, the night of didn't really hit me the way that, um, um, it probably could have if, if it did a certain things, um, certain ways it's because I've seen something that captures exactly that, that captures the, uh, certain institutions (laughs) in such a way that is just unlike anything I've ever seen. So I'm kind of subconsciously judging it against it. And that thing is the wire, um, I watched the first season of The Wire this weekend. I rewatched it because I was sick and I just didn't couldn't do anything. So I just kind of opened my Blu-ray for essentially the first time and watched it um, on Blu-ray in the new like widescreen HD transfer, what have you, um, sixteen by nine HD image. Um, the Wire famously was broadcast in four by three full screen uh, with with um, you know, boxes on the left and right. Um, so for this, for this Blu-ray release and this HD thing, that's also, it has the HD version on Amazon prime and HBO go and HBO now, um, for that, they converted it to widescreen 16 by nine presentation HD picture. And this is such a great show. I, I can't speak highly enough about it. It's, it's so spectacular. It's, it is unlike anything that when when did we watch the wire for the first time tiny that was back in like 2010 10 probably 10 yeah, i would say six years i've never seen anything or heard of anything coming close to being the yeah. wire good um and it's because it exists in this weird 
this weird place where it's not a conventional television show. It doesn't, it doesn't follow conventional television. Like when I talked about Bosch, I talked about how there was a, there was a plot line that, um, that I could, I could see like, okay, well this is, this is the natural end point for this, or this is the natural progression for this particular plot line because I've seen this in other shows and I've seen this in other, um, cop dramas and stuff. And the wire is not like that. It's just, it's the wire just breathes all its own. It breathes life into this, um, this, this city and this, this setting. And you see so many different facets of it. You see, and, and what's brilliant about it is that it starts as somewhat of a police procedural, like it, but it, it transcends the police procedural in such a significant way because it's not a police, a police procedural. It's, it shows police working a case. It shows, um, the, the drug dealers that they're, that they're pursuing, but it's not a cops and robbers thing. It's the, it's not even a shades of gray thing. It's like, it's just showing them doing their job. It shows the, the drug dealers doing their jobs. It's no, there's no melodramatic arcs. Excuse me. There's no melodramatic arcs that shows like, okay, well this guy is, this guy wants to get out of the game because he, because he loves, because he loves someone and there's, and there's, it, it doesn't have this escalation toward a, a um, a clearly um, cliched end point. Like there's characters that want to want to get out of the game because they, they're just not fit for it. They're not fit for the drug dealing lifestyle. And then they like, there are characters who pay prices for, for certain decisions. And it's just this very organic thing. It's not something that um, it's like, it's like the wire purposely avoids the television narrative format in favor of showcasing this world and this and this peek into um peek into this world and and when i say this world i don't just mean the criminal justice system or anything this is a show that began with the first season depicting um crime and police and then second season just each season each season introduces a different a different area of the city a different institution that all comes together and all just creates this panoramic view of this of this city that is that is an american city and every it lays out every problem with it and it lays out it lays a clearly um it it lays out a, a clear definition of of its problems and what's what's causing the problems there's there's a really incredible scene in the first season where uh two of the officers or two of the detectives are sitting in a car and they're watching as it's kind of late in the season they're watching as some of the drug dealers um in the in the drug dealing crew um are just like wailing on each other they're in kind of a, like a fight because um because one of the one of like the drug kingpin that has has this territory um like another another group has honed in on it and or has kind of gone into that area because there's a little bit of a vacuum. So there's two people that are two factions that are fighting each other. It's not this big dramatic thing. It's just they see that these like the characters we've been following see that these other characters are dealing on their on their territory and then they just take some bats and start beating the hell out of them. And what's great is that the two detectives in the car like look at it and they say, That's why we won't win. It's because when they when they mess up, they get beat. When we mess up, they give us a pension. And it's just like little like pearls of just completely um uh clear wisdom um as to what what the what the uh rules of, of this world is is just it's littered throughout the entire series and it's just incredible because you get deep like this this series just evolves and becomes this deep like it starts out as 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 i said transcending the police procedural and transcending the um a, a cop genre even though it's i think <laughs> like i have um I have a, I have a book that's The Wire, like a kind of, um, like a, I don't know, a a guidebook to The Wire, essentially. And the first one, like the first page of it is, um, is an introduction from David Simon, who created the show. And like the first sentence is, swear to God, it was never a cop show. (laughs) (laughs) And it's really not. And it's just, it's, 
<clears throat> it's a, I don't know. It's a culture procedural. It it is. It, that is the perfect way yeah. to describe it. I I don't know if you've mentioned it before. I think you may have mentioned it I think before I just the podcast. Made that up, yeah, actually. but it it is. It's 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 a it's such a dissection of of inner city culture and 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 the things that are tearing city a, a, a city apart and it's it's just it's so remarkable and it's so it's funny because me and uh, like we have gone back and forth with mike who who he he's watched a little bit of, i think he watched most of the first season he just wasn't into it he couldn't get into it or whatever mm-hmm. and it's just like it's a shame because man the show is so good i don't yeah. want like i don't know I don't know. I just I did not expect to go that in depth with it or, or go off the rails that much. You but can't help but do that when you talk about the wire. You really can't. And like I watched the first season. I, this is my third time rewatching it. I think, um, and this is the first time in HD. And and I'll get to that in a second. But um, going through it, like I mean, I watched this whole season in 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 two sittings. Um, it's a thirteen episode season of HBO. 59 minute episodes and before you even came over here tiny i watched the first episode of season two like this is this is such a remarkably watchable show and it's i mean it's it's just amazing and and uh to talk more specifically um a couple things a a few things and then and then we can wrap things up um one is that um seeing (laughs) going back and seeing it now um, and knowing the career trajectory that um, Idris Elba specifically has had, and knowing that he's going to be Roland, it's like it's it's funny because that guy is such a versatile actor, and he's such a dynamic actor that, like, I kind of like watching the show. I kind of like going into the show. I was like, oh, it'll be kind of cool to see to see um, Stringer Bell in this light because I know that he's going to be Roland Deschain. It'll be kind of cool to see him do like, I'll, I'll be able to, I guess subconsciously I was thinking that I'd be able to attribute some of his, his poise and charisma in the show to like certain Roland uh, character traits and, and that'll make me happy and everything. But like, I mean, this is such a, this is such an immersive show that the second that like it started, I'm like, Nope, he's, this is Stringer Bell. He like, it's, it's so weird to see him in that context now or like see go back and see stringer bell seeing so much of his work afterwards um i'm blanking on a lot of it but I'm, i mean i've seen him in stuff um after the wire and it's just seeing him in that like he is just such a fantastic actor um and then yeah uh just this show is just so, so remarkable um and like the final thought on it is it's funny is that like I said, it was, it was originally presented in uh four by three and in, in full screen. And the way that I understand it, I, I, and tiny, I mentioned this to you in, in our chats, but um, the way I understand it is that this, the, that the show was shot in on 35 millimeter in 16 by nine aspect ratio. So it, there is widescreen like prints like the, the, the actual film negative is widescreen, but it was just shot with uh four by three in mind. Um, so that that so the way that shots are composed is, is for that four by three um, aspect ratio. So what's funny is that there's a scene in season one where like obviously now that they've converted it to widescreen, um, there's two characters that are sitting that are sitting there and they're eating. And it's so funny because you can see in the scene like on the left and right side of the screen you see like the labels like they're eating Popeye's chicken mm-hmm. and uh they're both talking and then uh one of them grabs their drink that's that's like if you can imagine like you can imagine where the black bars were on the left and right side because he grabs this he grabs the drink and then as he pulls it up to him like you can see him move it so it's out of so that the label is out of frame <laughs> is out of sight of the of the camera as it goes into the center of the screen where the where the frame was when they were shooting it so it's just funny that there's like certain like accidental product placement in the HD version of the wire <laughs> um but yeah this just oh this show and I've, and this is only a rewatch of the first season. Yeah. Um, 13 out of 60 episodes. Oh, it's so good. When was the last time you rewatched The Wire? Gosh, probably four years ago. Yeah. And I didn't even make it all the way through because I was like, I can't commit to this right now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's the best show I ever made. Mm, yep. In my book. I mean, I, I'd challenge anyone to, <laughs> to challenge that, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a big statement, but. It's it's the best show of all time. It's it is, and it's yeah. 
like I feel like I feel like it's part of it is that I feel kind of a little bit pretentious, like louding that much praise upon it or saying like this is the definitively the best show ever. Like I feel kind of pretentious like that, like a little yeah, residual. I mean, it's subjective. You can't. It is. You can't make a statement like that objectively. But it's it's so unique, and the, and yeah. it's something that's never. I don't think. I, Unless there's something that I haven't seen or I'm not aware of, this is some this is an achievement in in television that I've never seen repeated, um, yeah. ever. Yeah. And and it's just it's so incredible the way that it 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 is. And I recommend anyone to check out the Blu-rays also because yeah. they're just really pretty. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, just as a closing thought, and then I'll get to some of the things that some people in our Facebook group said, and then we'll call it a night. But um. While I was watching it, like HBO Blu-rays obviously have digital, um, digital copies that you can redeem, mm. and so like one of the big things about digital copies for for DVDs and Blu-rays and stuff is that they freaking expire and it sucks. Yeah. Um. So just on a whim, I went ahead and redeemed my Wire digital copies, and what I didn't realize about this because I don't really redeem digital copies ever, um, and it's kind of silly to redeem HBO digital copies because I have HBO go and and uh and i subscribe to hbo and i have access to it i also have amazon prime so it's like there's not really a need for me to have the digital copies but something that i noticed is that hbo digital copies apparently don't expire when they say they do hmm. because i i redeemed the wire and then i was like this is pretty cool because not only when when you redeem it it's not only that you uh can redeem it it's not like okay you have to get it on itunes or something to redeem it or this is a digital thing that's only confined to this like when you redeem it you have a choice to either add it to itunes or to google play or to to flix or flickster or voodoo or whatever so like i kind of um in a cold medicine induced haze uh took all of my hbo blu-rays and and uh took the um uh, digital copies and put them on Google Play, uh, so that I have them all there. Um, and final thought on that is that I have season four of Boardwalk Empire that I apparently threw away the digital code. Um, uh-huh. so like it sucks because I have seasons one through three, but not season four, um, for it on Google Play. But anyway, um, so that's kind of cool. So if you have any HBO Blu ray digital codes that you're not going to use, throw them my way. <laughs> um, so okay, um, so let's see. So that rounds us out for potpourri. Tiny, do you have to go to the bathroom? I gotta pee so bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Tickets are on sale now for the third annual Shocktober in Irvington, presented by the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Join the hosts of the Obsessive Viewer on October fourteenth, twenty sixteen, at the Irving Theater for a one night event screening of short horror films, including the premiere screenings of J.P. Lex the Roman, the latest entry in his cross-medium elsewhere world universe, as well as the latest slasher from Snapshot Productions and Billy and Brandon Watch Movies. All of this and so much more. Come celebrate the horror genre in the historic Irvington area and get a chance to meet the filmmakers with live interviews after each screening. You can also win DVDs, Blu-rays, and gift cards to Irvington businesses. Tickets are on sale now at shocktoberinirvington.com. All proceeds will go directly to the Irvington Historical Society. And we will see you at the Irving Theater on October 14th. That is, if you dare. Okay, so that'll about do it for this uh, main topic of potpourri, uh, extended potpourri, this episode, essentially. Um, before we go, Tiny, I uh, posted in the Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Did you see that there? I sure did. Cool. I don't know why you said it like that. <laughs> anyway, um, I posted in the Facebook group, tonight we're recording an extended potpourri, so I'm curious what everyone in the group has watched recently and what you guys thought about what you saw. Um it was in between phone calls. I didn't really proofread that. I don't know what I was trying to say. Anyway, um, <laughs> it sounded fine. But anyway, um, once again, you can join the Facebook group by going to facebook.com slash the obsessive viewer and finding the link. So we got a few, we got a few good responses and, uh, I'll just kind of run through them. Do you, do you mind, Tiny? Go for it. Or do you want to? I can. Do you, do you, do you mind? Yeah. My throat's sure. really sore. Okay. 
Uh, first off, uh, our Patreon subscriber and friend of the show, Matthew Andreco, mm-hmm. um, he said he finally watched the new Ghostbusters movie. Wasn't as bad as what he expected from the public fallout, but was by no means a good movie. I agree with that to an extent. So, yeah. yeah. I um, had fun with it, but to each their own. Yeah. He said he liked the special effects and everything and the acting. Mm-hmm. That, Like he said, the actors were all good. Mm-hmm. Um, but the movie itself was lacking. So. That's uh, fair. Frequent guest Robert Feckus, uh, fresh back from London. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Good for him. Uh, he said he watched Green Room on uh, the train to Paris. He spent a couple days in Paris. Um, and he said he loved the film. Uh, he really, I really wish I could have seen this in theaters. It was tense, well acted, and the action portions were gritty. Um, the part where Anton Yelchin got hurt was extremely gruesome. I also want to see Macon Blair in more films other than Jeremy Saulnier movies. Agree 100%. I totally agree. And uh, Tiny, do you want to go ahead and read what I responded to him with? Um, just, just to get everyone the full effect. <sighs> Say it out loud. You're making me do it now. <laughs> I I mean, am. Uh, Matt Hurt, quote, Macon Blair, more like making me appreciate his acting talent. Am I right? Am I right, guys? End quote. Okay, who else said stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so different to hear other people say it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad. <laughs> um, uh, Craig Lane uh, from... Intermission Podcast. Intermission Podcast. Uh, said he watched Man vs. Snake on Netflix. It's a documentary about marathoning arcade games. He said it was really good. Uh, that sounds right up my alley. Someone asked him to compare it to... Uh, king of kong Mm -hmm. and he said he liked it better so nice i'm very intrigued with that Mm -hmm. because i loved king of kong he actually just posted a uh there's there's a new uh his website movieguys.org they have a new um android app that's really i mean it's a really good app like for their podcast and everything it's cool really clean it's i really like it check it out at uh on the google play store it's uh movieguys.org cool um other friend of the show from uh, the Geeking in, Geeking in Indiana blog and Indiana Geeking podcast. Which we were just guests on. We were just guests on mm-hmm. last week. Um, Tony Link in Troxel. the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do this, Matt? <laughs> Link in the show notes and name Tiny. I'm so sorry, Tony. <laughs> uh, Tony Troxel, our buddy. Um, <laughs> he said he saw the movie Lucy. Didn't mm-hmm. hate it. Didn't love it. Kind of the same reaction I had. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ant-Man again. He said he needs more of this in his life, uh, <laughs> which is great. It's an awesome movie. Um, and he saw part of season two of Star Wars Rebels because I'm horrible and should feel bad about my choices or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I haven't seen Star Wars Rebels. I'm not familiar yeah. with that one. I just now, th- I think that he was making a reference to our Star Wars episode where I said that I, that, oh, yeah. uh, I made the very... Uh, <laughs> stupid um comment that star wars is a terrible franchise and you should feel bad for liking it yeah that's i right. just now got that so yeah yeah i'm i'm glad that you see the light tony glad we can uh draw attention <laughs> to that again <laughs> right so totally. um and uh, our friend alex uh said she watched flash season two and american horror story hotel mm-hmm. yeah yep so some good responses thank you everyone mm-hmm and uh, yeah, once again, you can check that out on Facebook.com slash The Obsessive Viewer and find the link to the group page for it. And uh, so, yeah, that'll about do it for this week's episode of The Obsessive Viewer. Once again, tickets are on sale for Sharktober in Irvington. Those tickets will be on sale up until the night of um, on October 14th at the Irving Theater in Irvington. One night event screening, short horror films, local filmmakers. We're giving away prizes. We've got a 10 Cloverfield Lane Blu-ray. We've got Saw DVDs. We've got Shining DVDs, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. I can't really see on my on my shelf here. The Collector. We've got a lot of stuff to give away, along with gift cards to Irvington businesses, props from the movies, and uh, a bunch of a bunch of stuff um, to give away. And every ticket gets you a ra- gets you into the raffle. So there's a good chance that you'll come come uh, out of it with something. And all of it's to benefit the Irvington Historical Society, uh, which has a really great. Um, display of uh posters from the history of the irvington um halloween festival uh right now um so yeah uh next week um next week's episode is obviously going to be the recording for shocktober in irvington 3 Mm -hmm. unless something catastrophic happens um we'll see 
<laughs> Knock on wood. Geez. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, uh, okay, so to wrap things up, if you like what you hear and want to support the podcast, um, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the easier it will be for people to find the show in iTunes' search results. And if you want to show your support with your wallet, you can always do that by clicking the donate button on obsessiveviewer.com or in the link in this, uh, in this episode's show notes. Or, um, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer, uh, where you can choose from very, from many different reward tiers. Um, any donations made will help, will directly help pay the fees to keep the podcast running so that we can continue to provide you with our weekly podcast, uh, content here. And once again, thank you to our sponsor, uh, Westworld FM, which you can once again find at westworld.fm. It's a podcast, uh, seeking to dissect the latest episode of HBO's Westworld, uh, every week. So, Thank you guys at Westworld FM and at uh, the Midwest Podcast Network. So having said all that, Tiny, are we good to we, we, we get to wrap up? Yep, we'll see everybody Friday. Yes, we will see everyone Friday. Uh, once again, podcast one, promo code, sharktermineroventon.com. Having said all that, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you Friday, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Like, I just took f***ing Mucinex and, and Dayquil. Like, like it says like four hour, four hour interval. So I was like timing it down to like the minute <laughs> and like finally got it down to where I was like, I was like, okay, well at least I can talk. Um, so right. that's good. And then in my head, I was like, oh, I really wanted to record like a couple of anthology episodes. It's like, I can't f-ing do it. Mm-hmm. And then while I'm recuperating, I'm just laying on the couch and I'm, I'm just laying there like in like a daze, like just drifting in and out. This might actually end up being the tag. Um, just in a daze, I threw on Captain America Civil War, watched that. So, so good. Nice. And then, uh, threw in 10 Cloverfield Lane after that and was like dozing off and everything. And then, I don't know if this will be the tiger or not, but, and then, and then that's when I was like, okay, I kind of feel like watching something. Uh, like all day today, I'm just going to watch something. And I was like, well, Luke Cage is on. And I was like, well, I'm like, I'm like doped up on, col- on cold medicine. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I don't need something that I, <clears throat> I'm uh, not unfamiliar with. So that's when I broke out the wire Blu-rays and I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just watch a couple episodes. And then that was Saturday afternoon. And then Sunday night I went to bed at 3 a.m. because I finished the first season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've all been there. Uh huh. It's all in the game. <laughs> nice. Um, so, okay. So I need 10 seconds of silence and then I'll get us kicked off. Thank you for listening to the obsessive viewer. Presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find more of our episodes at OVPodcast.com, and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. The Obsessive Viewer's theme song is An Eclipse of Events and is provided by Loud Like from their EP, Mistakes We Must Make. You can find that and more great music from them on iTunes and like their Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Loud Like Music. Any and all feedback on the podcast is encouraged. You can email the hosts individually at Matt, Tiny, or Mike at ObsessiveViewer.com or send an email to the podcast in general at podcast at ObsessiveViewer.com. Check out the Obsessive Viewer blog at ObsessiveViewer.com where we post movie and TV reviews and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. You can also like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash The Obsessive Viewer and follow us on Twitter at Obsessive Viewer, at Obsessive Tiny, and at I am Mike White. If you want more obsessive content in your life, check out our sister site, ObsessiveBookNerd.com, for book reviews, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious, check out Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com and subscribe to the podcast on the podcatcher of your choice. Again, thank you so much for listening. We love you. Be excellent to each other.